Oil pipelines in the Arctic are built above ground to protect the tundra and permafrost. These pipelines are referred to as hot pipelines and they can't be buried in the permafrost, thus reducing the risk of permafrost thaw and the resulting damage to the pipeline. The pipeline has to remain hot in order for the oil to flow, hence they are insulated. Well, starting at the beginning, let's uh, begin with the surveyors. Laying out the location for where the VSM holes will be drilled. The survey crew carefully surveys and stakes the right of way to ensure that only the pre approved construction workspace is cleared. This project utilizes both existing gravel access roads and newly made temporary ice roads. You see here we are drilling the pilot holes and the VSMs will be inserted in those. We're drilling through permafrost and in this area permafrost could be well over a thousand feet thick. VSM is the acronym for Vertical Support Member. They are engineered for use with Arctic pipelines where permafrost is present. This crew is aligning the VSM to a horizontal cross member. It will then be bolted to the VSM. VSMs consist of a horizontal steel beam connected to a vertical steel pipe pile. You notice it's a, a cold yet very bright day. With the VSM now assembled, they they rig it up and begin lifting it. It's a long piece of pipe, so this takes a little while to watch, but we're going to watch it anyway. When complete. This pipeline will run for about 10 miles long. With 80 foot spacing between VSMs, that will be nearly 700 drilled holes for 700 VSMs. Constructed over 1975, 76, and into 77, the Trans-Alaska Pipeline has 78,000 VSMs and every single one had a 24 inch hole drilled for it and every single one had a soil analysis done to determine what type of VSM was required for that soil. This fella here helps to ease it into its hole Gravity and the crane are actually doing most of the work. He's just making sure it doesn't bind up. And once it's in, they, they're going to want to uh, make sure that it's plumb, level, and ready to uh, have a slurry poured into it so that it's a good solid anchor.
The top of the VSM will be set to ensure the clearance between the tundra and the bottom of the pipe will be a minimum of 7 feet. This will allow for passage of uh, migrating caribou which frequent the field. These guys are just clearing out the area now uh, so they can further make sure they've got uh, got the horizontal member nice and level. You need the VSM to be sitting in their plumb and and at which point you can uh, begin to backfill with a slurry. A surveyor is on site to ensure the VSM is level and at the required height. Although VSM minimums are seven feet above ground, as a pipeline approaches a road crossing, those minimums, as you see here, decrease to allow the pipeline to pass beneath the road through a buried culvert. Okay, now it's time to cement this thing in place. Now we got the concrete truck on site and we start moving the slurry into place. Guy there with that wand that's got inside the hole, he's basically, I mean that's a vibrator and he's making sure that there aren't any air gaps bubbles, what have you, uh, open cavities surrounding that pipe. So he's making sure that that's properly compacted. The pipe is transported to a pipe storage yard near the project location. The stream crew then comes by with specialized trailers to move the pipe to the right of way. Laborers loading the truck attach a tag line to each end of the pipe to guide it onto the flatbed. The laydown yard is a temporary operating yard for pipeline construction, operations, and equipment storage. The pipe you see here had to be trucked up from the pipe yard in Fairbanks where a lot of it was uh, welded uh, into double joints and then insulated then shipped up the Hall Road or Dalton Highway to Dead Horse uh, some 400 miles away something like that and then it would have been uh, stored at the pipe yard in Prudhoe Bay or Dead Horse and then trucked to the job site from there The green epoxy covering the pipe is corrosion prevention. The pipe is now at this point laid out in a long string uh, where it's waiting for the arrival of the uh, pipe gang to come along and begin the assembly of the pipe joints. Here's our first look at the pipe liners in action. Pipeline work can be physically demanding and requires a certain level of endurance and stamina. Building a pipeline is no small endeavor. Over 200 workers and 300 units of heavy pipeline equipment were on the scene for this project.
Yeah, that side boom's bringing over the uh, alignment tool, so we'll get a good look at it here. They don't go well around corners, that's why it only works in uh, straight sections of pipe, so uh, it has to be moved to the next to the next uh, string of pipe. So that device is an internal alignment clamp. And it is removed after a joint is welded and then moved ahead to the next joint. Internal alignment clamps are preferred for better alignment and as mentioned earlier they're not released until 100% of that root pass weld is completed. Once released, it can be pulled through the pipe using the connecting rod, which is anchored inside the next section of pipe. This is also used to slide together the new sections of pipe in preparation for their welding. As you can see, there's a lot going on here. The workers really have to be aware of their surroundings. As we see here, the pipe gang and the welding crew, they weld the various sections of pipe together into one continuous length. The pipe gang uses special pipeline equipment called side booms to pick up each joint of pipe, align it with the previous joint of pipe, and make the first pass of the weld. Laborers use 4 by 6 timbers to erect a crib to support the pipe off the ground. Enter the preheating crew. Now here is something unique to Arctic Pipeline construction. Preheating the joints of pipe prior to the welding. They use propane torches for this. While the preheating is going on, uh, the next crew is already doing their job, which is getting ready to join the two sections of pipe together. You can clearly see the VSM in the background that will support the pipe. These guys are waiting for the welder helpers to release the alignment clamp so it can be advanced to the next joint. There, the weld is complete so they can advance the clamp. That baby's still hot. There's the clamp that runs through both the existing section and the one they're going to uh, butt it up to. I'll uh, hear the fella on the back. He's given the instructions to the side boom operator of which way he wants him to move. Uh, in this case, he wants him to go a little bit to the right. That way he keeps it lined and now straight in. Now these two guys, they would be pipe fitters and their job is to sort of fine tune that alignment. And 
as you can see, this is very precise work lining up that, those two joints. Very precise. They have to leave a little bit of gap between the pipe. The gap or root opening they are working for here is a minimum of one sixteenth of an inch. And of course you want your alignment, the faces of the pipe to line up properly. You don't want one hanging over the other one. He's checking for high-low misalignment. So once these fellas are confident they've got the proper spacing that they need, proper alignment, they can then move the welder shack into place. and the welding crew can then enter and begin their tack welding of that joint. So once inside that welding shack, we do final alignment with that clamp. Adjust that clamp with a crescent wrench. Boom operator, once again, getting directions from the pipe fitter. Poor alignment may result in welding difficulties and a system that does not function properly. The consequences of failure can be catastrophic to the environment, the workers, not to mention the company's reputation and just plain expensive. You got the welder helper. The first pass of weld is also known as the root pass. And you got your welder. There'll be another welder in this scene. Pipe this size, I, uh, there'll always be two. One for each side. Each welder has a helper. For a videographer in this environment, it was pretty interesting. Almost hectic in there. A lot of loud music, a lot of noise, a lot of people getting work done. These people are working hard, it's cold, and uh, they do this 12 hours a day, seven days a week. And with some variations, this process is repeated over and over again. This is interesting work, so let's just let this play out and see how these guys do their business. Tight quarters in that shed. Two welders, two welder helpers, two pipe fitters. I was crammed in a corner, but it, it was a lot of fun. I've spent 35 years producing media for the oil industry. I consider it a privilege. The welders helpers they do the grinding and buffing. What you're seeing here is uh, the grinding. And then their welders are ready for their next welding rod. A weld all the way around the pipe diameter is known as a pass. The welding crew follows the pipe gang. For quality assurance, technicians inspect the welds using x-ray technology. More grinding. More welding. You do this, you figure you're this is going to be done for maybe, yeah, could be 10, 20, 30 miles of pipeline. It's a lot of weld. It's a lot of grinding. This, this is this, this is hard work.
shooting the welding arc with an old Satacon or Plumacon tube camera would permanently ruin the tubes. I found that with a chip camera you could shoot the arc straight on with no damage. Kind of like shooting the sun. I'm shooting on DV cam videotape. The camera cards uh, hadn't been invented yet. The grinding smooths out the weld bead and is performed between weld passes. As we said earlier, this is a lot like an assembly line. When one crew finishes it as its assignment, Another one comes along to do theirs. In this particular case, these guys are applying an epoxy. The area where the two pipe joints are welded together is called the field joint. And that welded part is unprotected, but it must be protected. So they apply an epoxy coating. Specifically, it's a fusion bonded epoxy. Corrosion is a big deal and it's one of the leading causes of pipeline failure. So once that uh, new welded area has been coated, they can then do the preparation and get ready to do the insulation of that joint. Here we find some laborers insulating the newly welded pipe joint. I did this particular job in 1976 on the 48 inch Trans-Alaska pipeline. We were called the Hugger Band Crew. In 2007, they were called the Insulation Fabrication Crew. Another piece on the footage here. This is the old style 4-3 uh, television footage. This was before the advent of your widescreen TV HD type video signal. This is what TV used to look like before we had high def or ultra high def. This fella here, he's applying an adhesive. As you can see, this is a pretty bright day. Again, we talked about a little earlier. Uh, I believe that this stuff was shot in uh, about 15, 16 years ago in April, early April. And as you can see, early April in the Arctic, uh, the days are quite long. There's probably 14, at least 14 hours of daylight on an April afternoon. Uh, however, it's still quite cold. You can hear the wind blowing in the background always seems to be a constant breeze on the slope. Nice in the summer keeps the bugs at bay. Winter time it can be a killer. If you're a worker, work in pairs. Think about it in your own world, having to work with your hands, fingers, in severe cold. Not as easy as this guy makes it look. One band 
short? Yeah. It's a one man band. <laughs> With the pipe ready to get lifted up on top of its uh, saddles, they're going to be working in close with uh, power lines, as uh, and this will be this will be dicey. They have to be quite careful. There's plenty of clearance. They just have to be uh, aware of the fact that while they're doing their work, there is other work that is continuously going on around them, and this parallel work is referred to as simultaneous operations or simops. Now let's lift this pipe. The side boom operators lift the pipe and then lower it into the saddles. Non-metallic slings protect the pipe as it is moved into position. At this particular point you can see they're starting to ease the pipe into what's referred to as a saddle and that'll hold it in place but it still can shift left or right uh, as the pipe it expands and contracts and then the side boom one at the back end he leapfrogs up to the front where he will then grab a new section of the pipe and lift that up and the whole process sort of keeps moving forward. Side boot tractors are ideal for construction as they combine great lifting capacity with uh, easy navigation over difficult terrain. These tractors are capable of lifting more than a hundred tons. Here we see the laborer grabbing his end of the lifting strap and attaching that to the hook. So the side boom operator can then lift up his section of the pipe. It's a very broad strap so that it doesn't cut into the insulation. Boy, that was a beautiful day. I always found it amazing that you take something that was so long, so big, such uh, hard steel, rigid as can be, and then when you lift up long sections of it, it becomes a noodle. Look at that. Before pipelines are laid to rest, they can be moved more than a few times. And each time they're lifted, the pipe will flex, uh, which is why it's important that the epoxy coating flexes along with the pipe. Not sure which trade group this guy is a member of. I think he's a laborer. Most of the trades are represented in these types of jobs. You've got your teamsters, operators, laborers, pipe fitters, some iron workers, and maybe even an electrician. I worked out of the Labor's Union Local 942 up in Fairbanks during a lot of the pipeline years in the 70s and early 80s. Before any pipeline is put into service, the entire length is pressure tested using water. This is called hydro testing. Technically it's called hydrostatic testing, but the worker in the field we just always refer to it as hydro testing. Pipelines just don't run in a straight line. There are slack loops and, as shown here, changes in elevation and changes in direction. To address these anomalies, let's watch the tie-in crew do their work.
Once the pipe is fitted into place, the assembly then is much the same as for straight pipe. In 1981, I worked on a tie-in crew for about six months, construction of the Kaparic pipeline. While we were fiddling with the adjustments on our end of the pipe, the welders were welding their end. Well, we had to be careful not to fiddle too much as the welders don't like welding on a bouncy pipe. And if it moved too much, we'd hear about it at lunch. Leak detection is a very important aspect of pipeline operation. Leak detection is the process of monitoring, diagnosing, and addressing a leak in a pipeline to mitigate the risk. The system you see being installed here discovers hidden very small leaks at a very early stage, thus avoiding severe accidents and their detrimental effects on the environment. That's not a roll of paper toweling. It's a roll of absorbent material, which is defined as a material having a capacity to absorb another substance. In this case, the substance is oil. And the absorbent prevents the small leak from dripping onto the tundra. And there you go. That's it. That's how you build a pipeline in the Arctic.